two of chapter 14 slash 15. Now we're gonna look at patterns of disease and then we'll go into uh, epidemiology. All right, so uh, there are things called predisposing factors. These are different factors that make a person more susceptible to uh, becoming infected and experiencing disease. Uh, some of these are uh, genetic, some of these are just male versus female, and some of these are lifestyle choices. Okay, so for example, the short urethra in females compared to males is why females are much more likely to develop UTI, urinary tract infections. Uh, UTIs are very uh, common in women and very uncommon in males. In fact, usually for a male, um, this would indicate a serious problem or uh, a sexually transmitted um, infection uh, or a prostate uh, issue or an immune deficiency, right? Um, okay, inherited traits such as sickle cell uh, gene, you know, obviously um, these first examples um, are not lifestyle choices. They're just, you are the way you are, right? You're female or you're not. You inherit a, a gene for a disease or you don't. Okay, uh, climate and weather, um, you know, you live where you live and that's gonna have its own um, risks and patterns associated with it. Um, but fatigue, Typically, you are in control of making sure you get enough sleep. Adults are supposed to get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Um, poor nutrition is another um, thing that you know most of us are able to control. Um, some people who are um, unfortunate, they live in poverty and they don't really have control over having a better diet. Um, but for those of us who do have control, we need to make good choices. We need to have our fruits and vegetables. We need to have our whole grains, right? We need to reduce um, cholesterol. We need to reduce um, simple carbs like sugars. Um, we should avoid processed foods, trying to eat things that we make ourselves, right? Age, obviously cannot control your age. But um, the older you are, the more susceptible you are to disease. Um, life, other lifestyle choices, uh, risky behaviors, right? Um, and then there's um, things like chemotherapy that um, greatly uh, suppress your immune system. Other uh, immune system suppression could be uh, like you're donating an organ or you're receiving uh, a donated organ. Um, or maybe you have an autoimmune disease and you need to have immune suppression to prevent um, or decrease the symptoms of that disease. Or you have a chronic disease. This could be a CF stands for cystic fibrosis. Um, we'll talk more about that later on in the class. But um, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder um, of the lungs and causes very uh, thick a mucus and this makes it very hard for these individuals um, it can range from difficulty breathing to um, having severe and chronic infection um, of course HIV does not have to develop into AIDS if you um, if there's any reason that you could be at risk of having HIV you should be receiving regular testing. Um, testing for HIV is tricky because it is slow, slow growing. Um, you need to be checked um, multiple times to ensure that your negative is actually negative. Uh, if you do receive a negative result, then you should receive treatment to uh, prevent it from ever developing into AIDS. Um, diabetes, you know, some people have diabetes type 1 where there's nothing they can do about um, their body just doesn't make insulin and they need to um, keep close monitor on their sugar levels and take insulin as needed. Um, other people develop diabetes type 2 uh, typically because they have poor nutrition, 
and they are not exercising um, and that they can make better uh, life choices to um, even reverse the diabetes completely. Um, but any chronic disease um, definitely makes you more susceptible. And you probably have learned a bit about this also because of the current pandemic. Okay, so incubation period, you know, is the time that it takes for the actual infection, the colonization to occur. This is a time where you will not have any signs or symptoms. You don't know that you're being colonized. Uh, prodromal period is the initial first signs. Typically, this is feeling really tired um, and maybe very minor um, other symptoms. Um, you may not even notice um, if you're, you know, distracted enough. Um, period of illness would then be the time where you have the most severe signs and symptoms. And then the period of decline is when you start to feel better, but you do, you do still have some symptoms or signs. And then the period of convalescence is where you are re regaining your strength and your um, you're no longer suffering from that infection. And so we can look at that in a chart to see that, um, and, and of course this, we don't have actual time frame because each disease is going to have its own specific length, uh, and range of, of time. But this does give you an idea that the incubation period is relatively small compared to the period of illness. Um, this red line here is showing you the relationship between your symptoms, signs, and the amount of microbes that are actually colonizing in your body. So as the amount of microbes increase, your symptoms um, increase. Okay. Um, it's also shown here. So the progression of an infectious disease can be divided into five periods, which I already mentioned and are related to the amount of pathogens. Uh, so the amount of pathogens shown here in red and the severity of signs and symptoms shown in blue. So there's a little bit of a lag, uh, but it is pretty close relationship as uh, microbes increase, your body uh, response increases and then you get your symptoms. Um, so this is essentially the same thing as this. Okay. Um, occurrence of disease. So we have a, the difference between incidence and prevalence. Incidence is the amount of new uh, cases, new infections that occur during a period of time. So you're looking at a specific population during a specific time period. Um, and looking at only new infections that occur during that time period in that population, that's incidence. Prevalence would just be anybody with that disease, whether it's new or old. Um, prevalence, we typically look at more for chronic diseases like tuberculosis and HIV, but you could do that for any disease. Um, and so it's the part of the population that you're studying um, during a given time that has a particular disease uh, and it would be all infections, not just recently contracted ones. And, uh, you know, uh, give you an idea. So influenza, we, we say that there's like flu season in the late fall and winter, um, whereas like something like HIV doesn't have a season. Uh, it can be, you know, any time of the year can be contracted. And uh, we've been tracking the trends um, for decades now um, to see is our screening working, is our treatment working. We, our, the goal is to see fewer and fewer cases of HIV and fewer and fewer cases of tuberculosis. Of course, in the United States, tuberculosis is uh, low. It's, it's not zero, but it is low. Um, and in, in uh, some countries, it's quite high. Um, but HIV, it's, it's still, um, well, it'd be interesting to see. Um, I haven't looked at any current data for HIV uh, this year. Been busy with the pandemic. But it'd um, be interesting to see what has been happening. Uh, but we, we did see in the 80s and um, 
mostly the 80s, there was a huge um, rapid increase in HIV cases. And as we did public health programs for testing, treatment, and education, we saw a, a decline. So here's um, only showing you up to um, like 2013. Um, we see the cases, right? So once we became aware of HIV as a disease, we started to um, test for it. And, um, and so the amount of HIV cases really, uh, it looks like it became this huge um, epidemic, but it really mostly is due to the expansion of surveillance. So this line, if you count, this would be the actual increase from um, 92 to 93, and the, the rest of this increase is due to the expansion of surveillance. Um, but with that, we see a huge drop off uh, the following year. So because we gave so much surveillance, um, we were able to do a lot of treatment and a lot of prevention, right? Um, things like education, things like providing condoms, um, providing clean needle uh, programs, things like that, um, we've reduced it and we've continued to reduce it. And then it's been fairly steady um, ever since. Um, and like I said, it'd be interesting to see if we had uh, data from 2013 to present day. Um, it'd be interesting to see, has it still been steady? Has it declined? Um, what can we do to, um, to get this lower? Okay, so this is uh, a good introduction to epidemiology, looking at trends, looking at the spread of disease and working to uh, prevent it. So an endemic disease is something that's always present in a population like colds. You can get a cold any time of the year, right? Gastroenteritis, you can get gastroenteritis any time of the year, right? Um, a sudden onset of uh, nausea, vomiting, or and or diarrhea, cramping, etc. Okay, um, so your uh, gastroenteritis is inflammation of any part of your digestive tract um, and the symptoms that come from that. So epidemic is a, a disease that suddenly a lot of people in a short amount of time are getting um, in a particular area. And you could say influenza um, and there are other examples as well. Um, and then of course you are very familiar with the pandemic at this point. It's an epidemic on a worldwide scale. Um, and influenza can also be a pandemic. So that's, I'm not 100% happy with having that as an example for epidemic, but it, um, cause it can fall under either. Okay, herd immunity, you've also been hearing about in the news. Um, uh, I'm not sure how well people understand this concept, but the idea is if enough people are immune, then they are not, if they're immune, the idea is that they're not spreading the disease. And so if you have um, some say about 60% um, minimum 60% of the population is immune, then you now have uh, such fewer amounts of, of this disease spreading and it is, is less likely that you will yourself become infected. The more people that are immune, the better the protection um, for those who are not immune. Uh, this is why vaccinations are so important because it is the best way to provide immunity to a population. There are people who cannot be vaccinated. Uh, some people's immune systems are not functioning well enough to um, where a vaccine won't be useful. And then few people have allergy to some uh, component of the vaccine, and then they wouldn't be able to um, have vaccines either. And then of course you have the very, very young that they're just not old enough yet to receive vaccines. So we need to protect these vulnerable populations by everyone who can get vaccinated should be vaccinated. Um, we also have examples of herd immunity that are just natural. Um, you can think of places where 
if you were to go and drink the water, you would likely become ill. But all the locals are drinking the water and they're fine for the most part um, because they've developed immunity against the, the common waterborne diseases in their area. Um, there, are, there are other examples as well. You can read about that in your book. Reservoirs. Where do these diseases come from? If we understand where they come from, we have a better possibility of preventing the spread of those. So reservoirs is it's a continual source of the infectious agent. Uh, it could be human, right? So um, and this really shouldn't say AIDS, it should say HIV. Um, is only found, well, HIV is, we'll say it's only found in humans. There's a close relative that's found in some other um, animals, but it's really, the HIV as we know it is a human reservoir. Um, gonorrhea, the sexually transmitted disease, also only found in humans. Polio and smallpox also only found in humans. When we have diseases that are only, um, the reservoir is only uh, human, then we have potential to completely eradicate it if we can get um, everybody vaccinated and or um, you know stop the transmission um, and then we you know how great is that we we got super close to eradicating polio um, and it is we are uh, we do consider ourselves to have eradicated smallpox um, so that's a great accomplishment of microbiology and um, hopefully we can get there with some other diseases. Another example, typhoid, uh, um, typhoid fever is another example of a disease that's only found in humans um, that we have the potential to get rid of. Uh, and we actually have a vaccine um, for some strains. Um, we also have the problem with carriers that I mentioned um, earlier I mentioned subclinical um, cases where people are infected and they don't know it because they don't have any symptoms or signs. You also have carriers, people who once at one point they might might have had symptoms and signs. They think that they have recovered completely from it. Um, and however, they have a small colonization and they continue to shed the, um, in this case, bacteria um, and, and can continue to infect other people, even though they don't have any signs themselves. We have other reservoirs that are animals, such as rabies, um, Lyme disease, right? So it could be a tick-borne, like Lyme disease, or it could be, um, uh, rabbit animals. Uh, we tend to think of dogs, um, but dogs only become infected with rabies if they get, uh, get it from, the, one of the true reservoirs, um, like bats, and skunks, and things. Um, Non-living reservoir would be soil or water, and that can be a little tricky. So spores are a great example. Botulism, tetanus, right, are clostridia um, group. But um, soil and water can also be a reservoir uh, for a lot of, like, fecal oral route pathogens, which then I wouldn't consider the soil and water to be a true reservoir uh, because it's been contaminated from uh, the feces of the infected host. So um, be careful with soil and water. Uh, when we're calling it a, a an actual reservoir, I would limit it to things like spores um, and then otherwise soil and water can be a, a route of transmission like the fecal oral route. Um, here is an example a list of a selected zoonoses um, that we've talked about several of these already and you'll see these in our um, like all these um, bacterial diseases we're going to look at in our survey um, of bacteria. These viruses we'll see um, in our survey of, of viruses. So you don't necessarily have to memorize this right now, but you might as well go ahead and start memorizing these. Uh, at the end of the class, we'll look at fungal infections, uh, protozoan and helminth, helminth infections. And so again, you can hold off on memorizing this, but at least look at it and get familiar. Okay, so 
types of transmission. You can have direct contact um, where this could be exchange of bodily fluids, it could be touching, um, or it could be close proximity um, in the inhalation of droplets. Um, so sneezes, uh, just air vapor from lots of talking, uh, vomit even will release droplets into the air. Um, so you have to be in close proximity and, and uh, so that's why I put it's not long distance. Whereas indirect transmission can be long distance like air, water, food, or fomites, non-living objects that can spread disease. So you touch something that somebody else touched, uh, such as a doorknob, uh, grocery carts, um, what do you call gas station pumps, right? Things like that. And um, if they didn't wash their hands before they touched these objects, then they could be um, placing their bacteria or viruses onto these um, substances and then you come along and touch them. And if you don't wash your hands, uh, you might um, ingest it or touch your nose or eye or mouth and get it uh, into your body that way. Um, so this is an example of someone drinking water out of a river. You should never ever drink uh, water directly from a source, no matter how pristine you think it is. Um, you should always have treated water that you know is safe. Food uh, handling, we'll have a discussion about that later on. Um, but of course, food can be a source of an outbreak, as you're familiar with probably with things like tomatoes and spinach and lettuce that have had recalls from pathogenic E. coli um, outbreaks, um, or just things like chicken that naturally have bacteria on them and have to be handled correctly. Um, and then of course the air, which, you know, this is how do you take a picture of air? <laughs> um, but just, you know, air can give you long distance. So these are vehicle transmission examples, long distance, indirect, indirect. Okay, you can also have vectors, animals, arthropods, fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, um, and these fall into two categories. Mechanical, where the arth arthropod's carrying it on its feet, Okay, or biological, it, um, the pathogen's actually reproducing in the organism, and then the organism, you know, bites you or sheds its feces on you and you get it that way, okay? So a vector is a living object, a living organism that carries uh, and transfers the infectious agent of the disease. Um, the biggest group of vectors are arthropods, fleas, ticks, mosquitoes. Um, it could be uh, the arthropods just has the organism on them, but they're not actually infected, or they are actually infected biological. Okay. Examples: malaria. Right. Um, you're probably most familiar with um, malaria is actually a protozoan called Plasmodium. There's a few species that can cause um, malaria, and this is when an infected mosquito um, bites you and transfers some of the uh, protozoan um, into your bloodstream, and then you become infected. Um, again, we'll look at these diseases um, during our uh, different lectures on diseases. Nosocomial infections, these are hospital acquired infections. Um, and these are, you know, these have been a big problem for a while and they continue to be. Um, there's a lot of attention. Um, when you go into your allied health program, you will have a lot of uh, protocols to try to prevent um, giving um, infections to your patients. So uh, we can call these nosocomial infections or we can call them hospital acquired infections, abbreviated HAI. Better yet, healthcare associated, not just hospital, any type of healthcare. Um, so typically 
we think of these as being acquired through um, the result of a hospital stay, staying in the hospital overnight, extended stay especially, um, but also people who live in different types of um, like supportive living situations. Um, we think, think of um, hospice or um, senior citizen homes, etc. Um, the CDC estimates one in 25 hospital patients has at least one um, hospital associated infection every day. One in 25 people will get a nosocomial infection. Why is this so common? It's because, well, you're in a place with a lot of microorganisms. Um, you are dealing with people that are compromised, right? You're in the hospital, either you're already sick or you've had some type of um, procedure where now you have a wound that's susceptible, right? Um, and so you have lots of ways for it to be transmitted um, as well. You're having different um, health care providers coming in and out. You're having different um, visitors, perhaps different patients, right? So you have the perfect storm of, uh, you know, transmission, compromised host, and the microbes themselves or everything's there. So it's the perfect recipe for getting uh, an infection. Um, despite modern ad advances in sterilization techniques, and uh, disposable materials, the rate of these infections continues to increase, has increased 36% in the last 20 years, and over 70,000 people have died as a re result of a hospital or healthcare associated infection. It's the eighth, eighth leading cause of death in the United States. The top three causes of death in the United States are heart disease, cancer, and strokes, um, and the eighth leading cause is an HAI, healthcare associated infection. So this can range from urinary tract infections, typical of uh, having to have a urinary catheter because you're not able to get up and go to the restroom. Um, most common are surgical site infections and lower respiratory infections. Um, most of the lower respiratory infections are pneumonia uh, related uh, and could also be due to having some type of respiratory device to aid in breathing. Um, we also have a high amount of gastroenteritis and one of the most difficult to treat are Clostridium difficile. Difficile because it's difficult. 12% um, of all gastrointestinal um, infections um, are Clostridium difficile. Um, and then we have some um, bloodstream infections, which could be due to, um, you know, IVs, but it could also be due to uh, lots of, it, like if they have a wound, right, an infection. Um, and then we have other that's not defined for us here. So uh, lots, lots of ways to get infected, right? Um, here are co the most common microorganism uh, responsible for like bloodstream infections, surgical wound infections, uh, gastroenteritis, um, urinary tract infections, right? So here's the examples. And these are names that you should be familiar with. E. coli I've talked about. Um, Staphylococcus aureus I've talked about, um, Clostridium difficile I just brought up, but you've heard Clostridium already. Um, so there are, uh, as you'll learn, um, several types of Clostridium um, species that cause different diseases. Um, so, and this is a maybe a, a, the edition before the current textbook edition, so you might have a more uh, slightly different looking chart. Don't need to memorize these numbers, just start to associate these names with the types of infection. MRSA and um, VISA and VERSA. So MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. VISA is vancomycin intermediate um, like intermediately resistant um, 
Staph aureus, and then Versa is um, is vancomycin resistant. And then we also have um, multi drug resistant organisms as well. So this is a uh, pretty scary. So Staphylococcus aureus is a pathogen already in and of itself, causes infections, but what we've seen is that there's been an increase in Staphylococcus aureus um, that have one or more um, antibiotic resistance. Um, methicillin is a whole group category of antibiotics and so is vancomycin. Um, so Staphylococcus aureus can cause a lot of different diseases depending on the location. Uh, so if it gets into the skin, cause um, what will might seem like a really bad uh, bug bite at first. It hurts, it's red, it's painful, and it'll continue to get bigger. It'll be warm to the touch. Um, and then if it gets um, bad enough, it might have to be drained. If it gets if it goes on without being treated, it could get into the bloodstream and cause a very serious life-threatening infection. Um, you could ingest it and become food, you know, have foodborne illness. Um, and sometimes it can even cause respiratory infections. And it is one of the common HAIs that we talked about, but it's also becoming common to be a community acquired um, as well. So this shows um, the increase in uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus infections. Um, it's fairly common someone on dialysis. It's most common for people with uh, urinary catheters, um, but also IV catheters, pretty common. And antibiotic uh, use in the last six months is much more likely to lead to having um, a, a resistant strain, right? So vancomycin um, or even uh, fluoroquinoline or um, ceftroxone, any of these antibiotics, uh, if you use them, it does increase your likelihood to then have uh, a resistant strain uh, of your microbiota, and then you're more likely to get a resistant um, infection, right? Um, in addition to what we just talked about, there are some other types of uh, bacteria that are particularly problematic when it comes to antibiotic resistance. Um, however, this is always changing, so I'm not going to ask you, um, I'm not going to ask you to memorize these at this time. Emerging infectious disease, this is also, you know, kind of always changing, but there are some that have been on the radar for some time as well. So things like Ebola, you know, we get um, periodic outbreaks of um, dengue virus you may or may not have heard of, but it is uh, actually two-thirds of the world's population um, is at risk, um, and it has been just growing in, in um, prevalence. Uh, Zika virus, you know, kind of came and went. We don't really hear people talking about it anymore. Same with the hantavirus, but they are still going to be around and cause a uh, you know, they caught, there's potential that we could have a big outbreak of those again at any time. Um, e. coli, the pathogenic strain of E. coli, um, hemorrhagic E. coli, um, we continued to always battle these outbreaks. Um, and then, of course, same with influenza, it's changing rapidly. All the time we have these new strains of influenza that we have to be careful to control. And then, of course, our current pandemic is an example. We've always known about coronaviruses. They've been on our radar. But even still, this took us all by surprise. So emerging infectious disease can be something completely new where this is a novel, you know, we've known about SARS viruses, we've known about coronaviruses, but this was the first time seeing this specific virus. Um, so it could be new, 
Um, or it could just be something that suddenly has increased in incidence, like we will see with like Ebola outbreaks. Um, it could be something that increases in virulence. Some of these Ebola outbreaks are more virulent than others, and that goes for any and all of these examples. Um, and it could be something where we know there is a potential for a big outbreak in the future. There are a lot of um, emerging infectious diseases listed in your book. You certainly do not need to memorize all of them. That's just too much. Why we see these emerging infectious diseases and why there's so many of them um, is because there's a lot of contributing factors. Viruses, some viruses are good at mutating very quickly, such as influenza. Um, bacteria, as you know, are able to share genetic information very quickly with each other through um, plasmid sharing through pilus uh, conjugation. So um, there's genetic recombination that leads to um, these big changes. And we also have inappropriate use of antibiotics, which is the main reason for antibiotic resistant strains. Um, we also have um, pesticides and other chemicals being used, um, industrial, um, especially farming, especially. So that's um, a huge reason why we get uh, resistant strains and get huge outbreaks. Changes in weather patterns, definitely, um, especially when there's tragedies um, like uh, hurricanes and earthquakes, right? Um, so ecological disasters, um, really, I was getting ahead of myself talking about ecological disasters and war and um, big sudden expansions and settlements. Um, changes in weather patterns, like just normal fall, winter, spring, summer, you'll see, um, especially with the vectors where the vectors are more common in the warm, moist, um, for example, mosquitoes. Um, other times we see the patterns where like influenza is more common in the cold weather. Um, transportation, we have such rapid transportation of just everything, people and goods. Um, and so that means that diseases have the potential to spread around the world very quickly. And again, we've seen that, we saw that with the current pandemic, right? Um, but sometimes we also have failures of the public health uh, system, like allowing so many people not to get their vaccines and having an outbreak of uh, diphtheria. We had outbreak of measles, um, which all can you know be prevented with uh, vaccines. Um, we see things like deforestation. We also see things like with our current pandemic where there's crowded, um, um, open air markets, sometimes called wet markets, because uh, they're selling fresh seafood, meat, fruit, vegetable, but like these animals uh, are freshly slaughtered rather than having that done somewhere else and having the animals then be um, chilled and preserved. Um, this has led to all sorts of outbreaks over the years. Okay, epidemiology time. So we have, uh, I think this slide got a little out of order, but we have three uh, well-known early epidemiologists, uh, Snow, uh, Samwise, and Nightingale, and they were uh, researching, um, trying to track down uh, how are these diseases being spread, uh, why are they occurring, and how can we prevent them? Um, and so this is a new approach to uh, medicine and keeping um, people safe. And these, uh, the results of, of their work really radically changed, um, changed our populations. It really lowered the incidence of these diseases. Um, so even though they didn't necessarily know the cause, like the actual infectious agent, they were able to uh, understand patterns and change behavior that that was causing disease. So epidemiolo epidemiology is the study of where and when diseases occur and how they're being transmitted. 
And the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, along with WHO, the World Health Organization, these are organizations that exist to collect and analyze samples, track um, diseases, and um, all with the goal of uh, preventing outbreaks, limiting them, um, and also when they do occur to control them so they don't um, get out of hand and they can uh, be taken care of more quickly. Of course, we've seen with our current pandemic that hasn't been working so well. Um, but it also shows you why it, it, it was tragic that the uh, CDC's funding got cut um, at a time when we crucially needed the CDC to be working um, at its finest. Um, we crippled it. So, um, but we will not, I will not go down that path. <laughs> we will go ahead and leave uh, more discussion about about the current pandemic for office hours. Okay, um, so the CDC publishes a weekly report called Morbidity and Mortality um, with the statistics of what they've been tracking that week. Um, you can access it at, at their website. You can also just learn about any um, infectious disease that you want to learn about. So it's a great website. And that is where a lot of the information for the survey of uh, infections is going to come from. Um, so I started talking to you about the early epidemiologists, John Snow, uh, Ignis, uh, Semmelweis and Florence Nightingale. So Jon Snow, you learned about in chapter one, he mapped the occurrence of cholera outbreak in London and was able to show that it, everyone that was getting sick with uh, cholera was uh, obtaining water or some product made from water um, that came from a particular pump. And so when they were, uh, when they decommissioned that pump, the amount of cholera outbreaks uh, or infections uh, in London greatly, greatly reduced. And so, um, and this was significant because remember when they tested the pump, it didn't show any of the cholera bacteria being in the water because it was intermittently in the water. It wasn't in the water at all times. So without his detailed research and, and mapping, they wouldn't have been able to um, show the need to decommission that pump. Um, this Dr. Semmelweis, he saw that there was a higher incidence in childbirth fever in the hospital than there was um, outside of the hospital and was able to um, kind of assume that this was due to um, doctors not washing their hands um, before delivering um, babies and so then he implemented um, hand washing and it and it was very very effective and then Florence Nightingale um, noticed that the same disease in um, soldiers was much worse than in um, civilians and tried to and successfully came up with a lot of reasons why this was the case. So she improved sanitation conditions, um, but I also think of food as well. Um, and this helped greatly reduce the amount of, um, of soldiers dying or becoming severely weak from disease, particularly um, this uh, typhus epidemic, typhus. And we'll talk about that disease in detail later, but for now, just knowing that she, uh, this nurse, did this amazing reporting and statistical analysis that changed the way that the military was operating. Um, it was killing a lot, a lot of soldiers, and so it. this was a huge um, revolution. Also, she was the first woman to be accepted into the statistical society. Um, so that was pretty awesome too. So these three bran these three people offer examples of three branches of epidemiology. You have the descriptive, 
a branch collecting all the data describing the occurrence of the disease. So this was uh, Snow's uh, search of the cholera, uh, research rather, of the cholera outbreak. Um, he got information about all of the infected individuals, um, where they had been, where they got their water from, and, and other related items and tracked it all to that, that pump. You had the analytical, which we just talked about with Nightingale's work, um, comparing the same disease in soldiers to the same disease in civilians, noticing a difference, and being able to um, look at specific factors that might uh, lead to this disease in soldiers. Um, and so this is called the case control method. There's also a cohort method for um, analytical uh, epidemiology where you're comparing a group with the disease to a group that does not have the disease. Um, and But she did the case control method. Uh, and then you have the experimental branch. Uh, couldn't fit all of this on one slide. So this is comparing a test group to a control group. These should uh, ring a bell for um, clinical trials, right? So you start with a hypothesis about a particular disease and then you conduct experiments to test it. Um, and so this would include the uh, hand washing uh, idea um, to prevent childbirth fever and all the um, you know, deaths of mothers that resulted from that childbirth fever. Um, and so that was huge. Of course, when we test on humans, it's, it's now called clinical trials and we would have a placebo, placebo group, um, placebo group, gosh, I'm getting tired guys, sorry. Um, and the placebo group doesn't know that they're receiving the placebo treatment. And if it's a double blind study, then the clinicians don't know either, um, that, that they're administering the placebo group and that helps prevent any um, cues or a different treatment that they might provide um, because they don't even know who's receiving it and who's not. All right, oops. So epidemiologists then, as you get the point now, uh, they're going to gather lots of data to analyze patterns of disease this includes uh, the age and sex and occupations and personal habits and socioeconomic status of the people getting sick. Um, we would want to know their history of immunization if it's one of the preventable diseases um, and presence of any other diseases in those people in the population that they live in. Um, and anything else that might help us, such as like what foods they eat, any commonalities between people in, of an outbreak, like did they go to the same um, place around the same time? Were they exposed to the same uh, thing? So you could figure out where, what's the source of the outbreak. So understanding patterns of disease, and of course the goal is to prevent future outbreaks and even control the current outbreak. So knowing the site of contact is important. Considering the period during which the disease occurs, is it seasonal? Is there Are there things that we can do related to that? Um, you know, indicate the effects of immunization. Is it, is it working, right? Um, and then things like controlling reservoirs. Uh, water treatment, having safe, clean drinking water available to people, having proper sewage disposal to prevent contaminating your water sources. Um, are you having proper food handling and storage? Um, are you having proper nutrition, right? Um, are we having good medical practices such as uh, checking uh, blood that's being donated um, so that we're being safe, right? So encourage and teach good hygiene to people in their everyday life, but also um, in specific industries as well. Uh, case reporting is important when healthcare uh, providers notice an outbreak, right, a sudden, sudden increase in a particular type of uh, disease. Uh, they should report it. 
um, they are required to report particular diseases called notifiable diseases. Um, and uh, of course, that's to try to control outbreaks of known dangerous diseases. But there's no real way to make sure that phys physicians are actually reporting, even though we tell them they're required to. How do we enforce that? Um, and also, you know, are these physicians, are these hospitals, uh, are they even capable? Uh, do they have rapid and easy testing to check for these notifiable, notifiable diseases? Um, is the money there to do this? So, um, yeah, physicians need to do their part to notify these diseases, but uh, the, um, you know, community, whether that be, you know, local, city, county, state, or even federal, uh, they need to provide the means uh, as well. So it goes both ways. Okay. Um, these are, uh, you know, a huge list of notifiable diseases. You do not need to memorize this. Um, but, you know, for your curiosity, um, and of course, now we would add COVID to this, of, of course. Um, morbidity means the incidence of a specific notifiable disease. Morbidity would be how many people, uh, the number of people affected in relation to the total population during a given time. And for the weekly report, um, it typically would be, um, they can give you uh, in the last month, in the last year, or in the current week, right? Mortality, of course, refers to deaths from notifiable diseases. And the mortality rate is how many people in that population have died from that disease during that given time. Um, an example, we've already seen a couple examples of uh, graphs from um, epidemiological data, but it's very common to see the number of reported cases uh, graphed over time. And that time could be year, uh, it could be month, it could be, you know, we're seeing things uh, daily, weekly for COVID because we're in the midst of, that, of the pandemic. Um, but by doing this, we can see patterns, right? So we know, okay, in these years, there was a huge increase and try to get more information to try to figure out why might that be. Um, and then also within the year, we, uh, if we look at each month, if there is a trend, uh, that seasonal trend, then this, it becomes uh, apparent, right? Huge increase in the amount of, of cases of Lyme disease during summer, especially July and August. Why might that be? Well, we know that Lyme disease is transmitted by ticks that live on deer. So when people are going camping and hunting, um, they are more likely to come in contact with the, the tick that uh, transmits the disease. And so then we can try to educate people on how to prevent um, getting uh, ticks, how to check for them at the end of the day, um, as well as preventing um, like having um, tall socks and tucking your pant legs into your socks so that your legs are safe and your feet are safe, um, things like that. Okay, that is the end of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. It's very fascinating. Please read chapter 14 very carefully and then just skim chapter 15. Um, there's not too much from chapter 15. Um, also, I've included a bunch of uh, little practice questions for you um, so you can go through those and make sure you can answer those. Um, of course, in addition to the end of the chapter questions. All right, see you in office hours. Bye.